When Jimi Hendrix hit the scene with his signature guitar sound in 1966, nothing would ever be the same afterwards. But why is Jimi's signature tone still a reference even in the year 2021? Welcome to another episode of Hendrix Up Close. Today I want to take a closer look at Jimmy's signature tone and the devices he used to achieve those tones. This is not going to be another how to sound like Jimi Hendrix YouTube tutorial video. Instead, I want to take a look at the gadgets but also the people that helped Jimmy to create his vision of how he wanted to sound. Before we get started, let's summarize and look at all the components of Jimmy's signal chain. Of course, there was his guitar, a Stratocaster that was played upside down, and because it was upside down, the bridge pickup would actually produce a brighter sound on the high E string than on a regular Strat. Then we had this amp, which after 1967, Jimmy exclusively played Marshall amps, although he never had an endorsement. Uh, but in the studio, you know, he was known to use Fender amps and basements and other amps as well. And then we have his effects pedals. We know about the Wah pedal, the Univibe, the Octavia, but first and foremost, the Fuzz pedal. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell for future notifications. All right, let's get started. So who was the king of fuzz? This is a photo of Hendrix playing with Curtis Knight and the Squires at the Cheetah Club in New York City, 1966. You can notice on the floor behind him is a Maestro fuzz tone pedal. This was indeed the first fuzz pedal that was ever made. It was invented by Nashville recording engineer Glenn Snoddy. This pedal was released and marketed by Gibson in 1962 as the Maestro Fuzz Tone. Apparently, Jimmy borrowed the pedal from a friend for a couple of weeks. He experimented with it, but unfortunately it didn't make his bandmates happy. But it certainly gave him some time to experiment with some new sounds. Well, it sounds like Jimmy started experimenting with tones early on and didn't always make his band leaders happy with that. Here is a funny clip by Ike Turner who actually fired Jimmy because of his use of effects pedals. Well, Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah, yeah. He played in your band? Yeah. And you fired him? Yeah. Why? Because he had all these damn pedals. He went in like, okay, okay, damn it, okay. Look. He had all these pedals, man, uh, uh, on, on, on a board, man, with the fuzz, the uh, 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 <laughs> wow, wow, the disc distortion and all this shit, man. And, 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 and I would give him a say, hey man, you take the solo. By the time he gets to going down all these damn pedals, man, the solo is over, man. And, and so I told him about that four or five times, man, and he, and he kept on doing it, so I cut him loose. <laughs> well, fortunately for Jimmy, he found an audience for his crazy, fuzzy tones. And when he moved to England in 1966, it seemed like the audience there was just ready for those raucous, aggressive fuzz tones. Already bands like The Who, Cream and others had used similar tones, but when Jimmy's sound hit the scene, it was truly something else. After Jimmy moved to England in autumn of 1966, he bought a British Dallas Arbiter fuzz face. He performed live with this pedal from November the 8th when he played Munich's Big Apple Club. Apparently the audience went completely wild 
over his new fuzz tones and they actually stormed the stage. Fans actually pulled Jimmy off the stage and Jimmy's guitar neck broke from the fall and he reacted by smashing the guitar into pieces on stage for the first time, which sent the fans into more hysteria. This is the first known photo of Jimmy using that fuzz face. Two weeks after this concert, Jimmy used the fuzz face in the studio for the first time on the track Love or Confusion. This song was part of the album Are You Experienced? There was one sound in particular that made Jimmy sound like no one else and like from outer space. And that was the sound of the Octavia. According to Jimmy, it sounded like a flute. The inventor of the Octavia is an engineer named Roger Mayer, who met Jimmy early on in 1966 at a show in England. But let's hear it from Roger himself of how he met Jimmy and how the Octavia pedal ended up on the famous solo of Purple Haze. Jimmy about one of the new devices I, I, I'd been uh, developing which is called the Octavia and that uh, he might be interested in having listened to it, uh, you know, a, a listen to it and, and he said yeah, yeah, he was really, really excited about hearing it and um, he invited me down to uh, a gig uh, in about a couple of weeks time it was at um, Chiselhurst Caves in uh, Kent and um, backstage, uh, before he we went on stage, uh, I, I, I brought a prototype along of this device and um, Jimmy played with it backstage and um, yeah, you know, that, that, that was the beginning of, of, of our friendship and he suggested that, um, you know, I come down in, a, it, it wasn't about five days time, to another gig in, at the Ricky Tick in Hounslow and um, then I went to that gig and he said, oh, bring, bring along the Octavia. He said, we, we're going to do some recording afterwards. We're going back to Olympic Studios after, after the gig in Hounslow. And, um, yeah, we went to the gig. The gig was pretty wild. Jimmy ended up putting his Stratocaster neck through, through a very low ceiling in the club, you know. And after that, we, we went back to Olympic Studios. And uh, that was the night um, that Jimmy recorded, uh, recorded the overdub uh, solo for Purple Haze using the Octavia. And he also did um, another tune on the same night, another solo, and that was for Fire, both using this new device, you know. What a lovely gentleman. And over the years to follow, Roger and Jimmy developed a tight working relationship. And Roger not only helped Jimmy to further develop the Octavia, but he also helped him with his fuzz pedals. Because fuzz pedals in those early days were very unreliable. They were based on germanium transistors. Sometimes would cause dropouts and just would sound different on each night. With the help of Roger, Jimmy was able to tweak the sound of his fuzzes. And funnily enough, they very often used the housing of the fuzz phase. So that's the reason Jimmy is so often seen with a fuzz face, where he wasn't actually always playing a fuzz face, but some custom fuzz that Roger Mayer had put into those fuzz face housings. Mayer started to switch from germanium to silicone transistors, which are way more reliable, but also don't sound as warm and analog as the germanium ones. But it's fascinating that up until today, Guitar players all over the world are playing fuzz pedals with both germanium and silicon transistors. And then we have this other strange box that creates this swirling, mm, sucking type of sound. Kind of like a Leslie speaker, but not quite. Let's hear it from the Japanese inventor of the Univibe named Fumio Mieda, who tells us in this rare interview of how he came up with the idea of the Univibe. これ、レスリーからヒントを得たんじゃないかとかですね。放送局の聞いてたからじゃないかなと思います。っていうのはその当時ですね、あのモスクワからの宣伝放送非常に
真空変調のようなそれは飛んでくる間にいろいろ変化,、ええ変化ね、してしまうっていう。えーそのいわゆる何,何か機械で書いてるんじゃなくて、ええ、もうその空気の音とエフェクターっていう言葉は多分聞いたことがなかったと思うんですまだそれすらもないで、ええ、ただこういった音楽がああいったふうに変化するとあの非常にいい感じだなってどういうふうに使うかは具体的なおし But Jimmy was and isn't only known For his use of effects. He also had a gorgeous clean tone that even tone gurus like Eric Johnson take as a reference to create their own tones. So, what amps was Jimmy playing? All we see today is that Jimmy was playing Marshall amps pretty much everywhere, but that wasn't always like that. He only met Jim Marshall in 1967. And we don't really know what he was using before that. We do know that in the studio he would use all kinds of amps, also a lot of Fender amps, Fender bass mats, and stuff like that. But who was this Jim Marshall guy? Not too many people know that Jim Marshall was actually a drummer. And that was the reason they met, because he was Mitch Mitchell's drum teacher. And so Mitch Mitchell introduced them at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. Jim had already built a full stack for the Who guitarist Pete Townsend as early as 1965, where he came up with the genius idea to put four speakers into one cabinet, inventing the 412 speaker cabinet. As soon as Hendrix got his hands on those Marshall amps and speakers, he wouldn't use anything else anymore. But he never wanted an endorsement, he always paid full price. That is pretty astounding when you think of the fact that Jimmy ended up being the poster child for Marshall amps, which became like one of the two most famous amps in the world. So, up until now, we have only been talking about Jimmy's live sound pretty much. But this is only half of the game because Jimmy also left a legacy of being a true innovator of recorded guitar sounds. But besides Jimmy, there was a second person who was highly instrumental behind all those sounds, and his name is engineer Eddie Kramer. Let's listen to this interview where Eddie talks about his relationship with Jimmy and how he helped Jimmy to make his sonic visions come into reality. We set up and、um, Jimmy just still wasn't saying anything. Got the amp set up, got the drum set up, I was furiously miking everything. And Jimmy went in and plugged in and went, and I heard this, these chords. I went, holy crap. I mean, that was the most scary thing I've ever heard. It was one, I mean, it obviously was great, but it was also scary. If you can imagine, I'm a young punk kid, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out how to. Record all this stuff. But、yeah. we got on really well.、Uh, I got some sounds for him within a few minutes, and I said, Jimmy, come in, come in, come in, have a listen.、Yeah. And he, he listens and, he's, and he's, he's just smiling. He's like, Yeah, okay. And so he runs out into the studio and he starts twiddling with the amp and the pedals and shit like that. And he's all right, and he says, All right, try this. And he starts playing. Okay, so I'm twiddling some more knobs and stuff because I'm known as the knob twiddler. Yeah. <laughs>、um, And he came back in and listened. And it was like, this was the beginning of this. Okay, you're going to do that? Well, I'm going to do this. And we try to top each other each time. So let's summarize real quick. We now took a look at most of the very important gadgets or components of Jimmy's guitar tone. And we also heard from some of the people that built those devices. But this episode wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention the most important thing. And that is that none of these devices are really responsible for Jimmy's music and tone, but this tone came out of the master's fingers himself. Out of his fingers, his heart, his mind, his soul. It's important to say that no effects device 
can ever replace the talent or the vision of an artist. And it is truly amazing that even today, Jimmy Stone still holds the standard on many levels, on a clean tone, a fuzzy tone, a wah sound, the articulation that he was able to get on a wah pedal. And some of those late 60s martial amps are still some of the most sought after gear pieces today. I hope you learned something new today in this episode. It was a lot of fun and I hope you will tune back in next week for my next episode of Hendrix Up Close. Until then, please subscribe, please ring the bell, join the club here and Happy New Year! <laughs>